My father always told me that too much of something is a bad thing, except in the stock market. Too many stocks advancing is never a bad thing, and the market breadth dynamics continue to take shape with almost everything rallying today apart from bonds. We saw movements in stocks, commodities, cryptos, while bonds got sold as yields rose. But the thing antagonizing small caps for the last 18 months has been yields. Higher interest rate policies have led to stark underperformance in small caps. Now we have to ask the question. Question. With a Republican sweep looking likely after Trump's assassination attempt, does this affect the outcome of interest rate policy? And if yields continue to rise on the thought of easier Republican fiscal policy, what happens to small caps, what happens to bonds, and what happens to the economy as a whole? Today, we're going to discuss what a Republican sweep means for the market, and we're also going to talk earnings, both the Russell 2000 and the S&P 500, and what are the likely outcomes that come next in the stock market. Should we brace for volatility or simply more upside. We've got a lot to talk about. Let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. So if you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. Now this is the daily heat map of the S&P 500 and a lot of red and a lot of green, particularly here in financials. And it had to do with a whole bunch of factors. I think the first one is a bunch of these insurance stocks reporting tomorrow, stuff like progressive chub in the week ahead and a lot of those stocks just running up into those earnings. Next, we actually had Goldman Sachs report very, very good earnings that boosted the capital market segment as well as asset management. And then BlackRock, even though he was down 0.60% in the day, it was up about 1.2, 1.3% in pre-market. So the market definitely did like some of the stuff it was seeing in that name. And then I also think we saw a rebound of the banks here in JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citi. After a bit of the earnings sell-off we saw on Friday, I did say the banks report reported very good earnings in my personal opinion and the market reaction was unjustified and here we are JP Morgan is now higher than it was pre those earnings but at the same time with the Trump assassination attempt and the odds for Republican sweep going way up I think we're also seeing a bit of a risk on moving to banks with the market saying hey if Trump gets in we're probably going to see easier financial regulation we also saw upbeat action on the Trump news here in energy real estate as well as industrials and then we saw vicious sell side in utilities down 2.4 percent for the day now the bigger names were very very mixed nvidia amazon meta were all down on the day about half a percent up to as high as one percent and then we had stuff like tesla google apple microsoft they were in the green we saw a mixed time here in semis software was actually fairly green and then a bit of a dumpster fire here in healthcare if we actually dive into sector analysis we saw stuff like energy financials industrials real estate do really 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 well these stocks are going to do well in a republican sweep particularly energy financials real estate and we saw the market bid them up accordingly with energy and financials both up 1.5 percent a very strong day in those names we also saw green action in communication services and technology they were up 0.4 and 0.2 percent respectively with defensive sectors getting sold off for risk on sectors with healthcare consumer staples and utilities being the worst three equity sectors with utilities down 2.4 percent brutal action right there however this is for the s p 500 if we actually dive in we actually saw fairly muted action here in large caps across the curve value core and growth the outstanding equity factor today was small size across the curve value core and growth up 1.9 percent second was mid caps and then large caps however large caps didn't get sold off we did see money going into large size but the majority of money went into value core as well as smalls across the equity curve. And we really saw this in the price action today. The IWM up 1.9%, mid caps up 1.37%. Everything else was below half a percent in return. Dow Jones being the best sector, followed by the NASDAQ composite, the S&P 500 up 0.28%, and then the RSP. And this is really telling us we are seeing a size rotation over value and growth. That was really something we were grappling with last week because we saw large cap value up 1% and we were trying to determine is this a value rotation? Is this a rotation out of momentum into value and core? But now we're starting to see that this is actually just a size rotation and it is taking shape 
with the IWM leading and mid-caps in very close second place. So that's what we should continue to expect. And we need to keep evaluating to see how this rotation takes place. Is it going to be in value and smalls or just smalls as a whole? But what we are starting to see is not necessarily a rotation out of large caps, but small caps being favored ahead of large caps. Now, there were some very interesting dynamics at play when it comes to the equity market. So we just discussed the IWM up 1.9% looking very, very strong if we actually zoom out on the daily chart. But that was in the face of the 10-year yield actually rising today. The 10-year yield actually gained 1.1%. And again, that had to do with Donald Trump. If we get a Republican sweep, that's likely going to mean more spending and a bigger deficit for the US economy. Yields rise as a result. And so we saw the 10-year yield up 1.1%. And the 30-year yield up 1.41%. But what we actually saw as a result of that was the IWM still the best performing sector closing at the 217 area. And that just goes to show you that despite higher rates, which has weighed on small caps over the last 12 to 18 months, smalls rallied in the face of that. And that's really going to show the broadening out nature and just the valuation discrepancies we're seeing in the market. The market is starting to re-rate that as a result. Now, we did say here in small caps, anything above the 208 level would be very, very strong. In the weekend video, we said there were two options that was likely to occur uh, for small caps. Either we were going to see a little bit of a gap down here on Monday into this 208 area, and then we're going to continue the rally or we were just going to see a gap up and go. And that's exactly what we got with small caps up 1.9%, yields rising, bonds taking it on the chin, and Bitcoin too up 4.74%. It's actually bouncing strongly off this 54,000 region. We do know that Trump has become increasingly more crypto friendly, and that's why we're seeing the crypto dynamics, or at least the Bitcoin dynamics right now. It does look like we actually closed above these highs right here, and that probably opens up the 65, 66, 67,000 region, and maybe even some of these highs as we saw in the 70,000 area. So pretty strong action here in Bitcoin. These candles look very, very strong. And I do think this is probably going to continue. Bears had the opportunity to take it down. They could not. And that probably means we do go higher. Bitcoin's still in this massive range though. I think what we are seeing is a little bit of a correction in time. I think if you really are bullish Bitcoin, you want to sort of buy at these levels. I think anything below 60,000, if you're a bull, should see outsized returns relative to gold and silver. Now, gold very close to new all-time highs, closing at the 24. 21 area here on the day up half a percent very very strong now the bears did come in at the top that's a very brutal week let's just zoom in a bit however a strong bounce off the 2300 level right here it's been a quiet rally approaching those new all-time highs but i think we probably go to 26 2700 here in gold by years and that's obviously going to be spurred by the rate cut narrative silver did not follow suit however it is significantly outperformed it has significantly outperformed gold on the year to date chart but silver was down 0.37 Yes, I'm still long from the $28 region. I still hold silver and I'm still bullish on a $60 silver over the next 12 to 18 months. And then crude, it does look like crude actually wants to move lower. And it seems that what the Saudis are doing here with some of the cuts is actually really, really helping. I think we should see downward action into crude. But just remember, guys, between $77 and $87, that is the range we're going to trade in for the rest of the year. So to see this type of a price action in crude, yes, volatile, not unexpected. But the S&P 500 opened at an all-time high higher we actually saw a wick move up to the 56 6700 area and i have something to show you guys the call gamma resistance has moved up to 5,700. So that is our next resistance area. That is our target we're looking at right now. So we're buying dips, selling rips to the 5,700 area right here. I think we're probably going to swap between 5,650, 5,600, and 5,700 because these are very, very built out strikes and OPEX is fast approaching. But as it is right now, based on the data we have today, you want to buy dips, sell rips to the 5,700 area. And that's where we can actually find a bit of a pullback. Now, I did say we probably would find strong resistance at the 5600 area and we actually did see that we did wick above it don't get me wrong but with the call gamma resistance moving up to 5700 and the gamma flip zone now being at 5335 it's very obvious to see our supports and our resistance zone as well as our target levels 5700 is the upside target we want to look to and assuming we do get pullbacks here in the s p 500 5545 is probably where we do find support right now in the market i know it's sort of just at this no man's land it's not really touching any other supports but if we do pull back i think we find support right here and continue to move higher in the s p 500 now that is obviously going to be led by mid caps small caps are going to lead but the S&P 500 is exhibiting strength. I mean, up 
0.28% today. NASDAQ 100 up 0.27% today. And it actually outperformed the RSP, the equal weight, up 0.11%. And that's actually not to say that breath was bad. If we actually pull up the advanced decline line, we saw an increase here in stocks advancing. The S&P 500 saw 280 stocks advancing against 223 stocks declining. And that's why we saw a move up in the advanced decline line. So even as we go ahead and hit new wick all-time highs, not quite a closing all-time highs, we are still seeing more stocks advance than decline. And despite the breadth rotation we're seeing in smalls, we are seeing strong breadth and strong momentum in the S&P 500 as well. And that bodes really, really well. What we can actually see, right, what's perfectly plausible is for the IWM to outperform, but the S&P 500 to still be in the green. That could possibly happen. We could still see a rally in large caps in some of the mega caps, but it just won't be as strong as it will in some of the smaller names. That being said, I'm liking the price action we're seeing in the market right now. And I do think the sector and size rotation is going to continue and we will finish very close to that 58, 5900 area at the end of 2024, particularly with core gamma resistance moving up to 5700 as it is right now. So guys, you want to buy dips at the 5500 area, 5547 and you want to buy dips, sell rips all the way to the 5700 area. That's where we can look for downside. But up until then, you don't want to be short the market. Momentum is on the side of the bulls. Now, looking at global market trends, this is last week's new highs, new lows. Pretty much all of the major developed and emerging markets. And what we see is a plethora of new highs. As the S&P 500 has made new highs, as the market rotation has continued, we see a bunch of European countries making new highs. And if they haven't made new highs, they're at 40-week highs or 10-week highs. The only countries that haven't really made new highs and are still a bit lackluster all in all has to just do with South America. But from Europe into Asia, as well as North America, the United States, a lot of countries are at new highs, if not at new highs, very, very close to new highs. But that was last week. What about the year and now? And I asked you guys in the weekend poll, what index are you most bullish on? And the results truly surprised me. I always knew the Russell 2000 was going to have the most votes and it did. 48% of you are most bullish on the Russell 2000. What took me by by surprise though was the Nasdaq 100. I thought this would be the lowest. While it was the second lowest, it was in close second place to the equal weight here at 25%. So very, very interesting. Quite a lot of you are actually still bullish on big tech and the Nasdaq 100. Maybe that's because most of you are probably exposed the most to this index. Nonetheless, you guys see the Russell 2000 as the best performing index this week and then the Nasdaq 100 and the RSP in close second and not a lot of love for the Dow Jones. And thank you to all 506 of you guys that voted. Now, let's dive into some seasonal stats. And this is the S&P 500 past performance during July 15th to December 31 after a turn of the year hat trick. Now, a turn of the year hat trick is when we have December, January, and February all positive. And essentially, what are the returns we can expect in the second half of the year when we have gotten this very bullish trigger? The turn of the year hat trick is one of the most bullish triggers we could possibly have. Now, we have 25 occurrences. It triggered here in 2020. 24. You can see that in December, we returned 4.4%, 1.5% in January, and 5.2% in February. And the returns from July 15th to December 31st are very, very bullish. Average return, 7.53%, 23 wins, 2 losses. And we really only see pullbacks here in September. It's possibly when we could get a drawdown as well as October. Other than that, we just get very bullish price action and that bodes really well for the S&P 500. And also have a look at the max drawdown. Have a look at this right here. Max drawdown in 1998 was 18.5%. We finished the year up 4.6%, which means had you actually bought the dip right here, you would have had returns in the S&P 500 of like 22%. So if we do get a 5%, 10%, I dare say even a 15% pullback in the S&P 500 over the next six months, you buy the dip, don't trip higher prices will ensue. At least that's what history tells us. And we are in the thick of it. Earnings season is here, Q2. And we kick Monday off with a fairly light day in what is a pretty dense week of earnings. Now, I was going to cover Goldman, but we did have a look at some of the banks on Friday. So we're actually going to cover BlackRock here in the asset management space. Now, very mixed earnings here. We beat on the EPS side. Sales was a miss. Asset management was a slight miss. Net inflows. This was a huge red flag, a huge miss here from BlackRock. And the only reason why the EPS beat had to do with active management, the fees in 
increases in active management and their technology services division. Other than that, it was actually a dumpster fire here for BlackRock. I thought these were actually really bad earnings in my personal opinion. Now, I didn't get to see guidance. I didn't hop on the earnings call, but I thought these were not great earnings for BlackRock, particularly with the net inflows. But the market seemed to like it, and maybe it has to do with valuation, but the stock's not expensive. I don't think the stock's cheap relative to its peers. Up 1.15% in the pre-market. The segment is recorded in the pre-market. So obviously the market is seeing something I am not, but yeah, not a good look for BlackRock, but this would still go down as a beat, a slight upside surprise and a revenue miss. So, so BlackRock still pushing its weight in the financial space. Now with Goldman's earnings in the rear view, what about the rest of the market? Now this right here is S&P 500, consensus earnings, revisions via upgrades and downgrades for every single sector. This dark blue line right here is the S&P 500. 2024 sort of starts at this red line right here. And we could see we've had up revisions in financials. Tech and MCG have had quite the up revisions. And we've seen down revisions in materials, defensive sectors right here, industrial cyclicals. We've seen sideways revisions here in energy. We've seen down, up and down again, pretty much sideways, which leaves the S&P 500 virtually unchanged in earnings for the year. Earnings for the full year 2024, the expectation is about 10%, which means upgrades and downgrades or earnings revisions are tracking that for the S&P 500, mostly held up by up revisions in technology as well as financials. Now, this is the S&P 500. What about the Russell 2000? And earnings expectations for the Russell is expected to be very, very strong. Have a look right here. This is where we are the second quarter. Earnings expectations are for 18.4%, 0.4% in revenue. Then in the third and fourth quarter, 62.5% earnings growth and 89.1% earnings growth in the Russell 2000. And that is on revenue of 3.6% and 5.7%. So there's going to be a lot of margin expansion right here in the Russell 2000. These figures are absolutely crazy. This is like NVIDIA growth numbers. Then that actually continues throughout 2025, 46.9%, 53.2%. And yes, we do see a deceleration in earnings, but we're still hitting double digit figures above 20% here, 33.6% in the third quarter, 2025, the fourth quarter, 2025, 27.3, and then 28% in the first quarter, 2026. So the rally we're seeing in the Russell right now in small caps and the rally that's going to come over the next couple of months is the market literally pricing in all of this because the Russell has gone nowhere for the last 18 months. In fact, we're down about 12, 13, 14% from its highs made. So we're going to go ahead, price all of these earnings in. And if these earnings do materialize, you're going to see the Russell go on a blockbuster rally. And even with the current earnings, the Russell is still fairly valued. It trades at about a 14, 15 forward PE. And that suggests about 10% annual returns here for the Russell. So, you know, if you go ahead, buy small caps right now or the SP 600 or small cap quality ETF, you're getting great value, great growth, and a great way to diversify your portfolio, especially if you're heavily into large caps and mid caps. Now let's switch gears, talk about the economy. We got a little bit of a note here from both, but let's go ahead and read. Inflation box ticked, focus shifts to growth. Last week, inflation ticked another box for the Fed. Headline inflation missed by 4.2 standard deviations versus estimates, the biggest missed in our data's history since 1998. This confirmed our thesis that we're on the path to Goldilocks with macro and inflation back in sync. The recent progress means the Fed's reaction function is becoming more balanced as Powell told Congress. Elevated inflation is not the only risk we face. This week, retail sales will be the focus. We expect retail sales ex auto to fall by 0.2% month over month, which would strengthen the case for the easing cycle to start. Additionally, industrial production and housing starts should provide an insight into economic activity. We think the economy is moderating, not rolling over, but we expect our view to evolve with the data. Equities, stars are aligning for cyclicals. The big question in the market is, is growth slowing too much? But tamed inflation means the Fed can solely focus on growth, putting the Fed in a much better position, especially after 5.25 percentage points of hikes. The stars are aligned for the rotation into rate-sensitive cyclicals. Rate pressures is easing. Growth would ultimately be supported by the Fed. And most importantly, earnings are broadening out as the other 493 come out of the earnings recession. And too long didn't read, if growth slows too much, the Fed will support the economy because inflation is doing what the Fed needs it to do. And actually looking at 
at growth this is both his gdp tracking estimate for the second quarter guys gdp figures are coming in a couple of weeks right now both actually see a two percent gdp print for the second quarter we've actually seen a little bit of a rebound off the lows here in june as we've had slightly stronger data and disinflationary forces clearly at play you can see core pce core cpi and a couple of the other fed inflation models are all pointing to a clear disinflationary trend at the same time the two-year u.s inflation swaps also dropped 10 basis points on wednesday and it's also signaling to us that future expectations for inflation are expected to go lower this is a really really good thing if we could see growth come in line for this quarter anything above 1.8 percent would be in line we see clear disinflation that's going to bode really well for stocks the economy equities even bonds and that's actually the type of market action we want to see we want to see disinflation with stable growth not disinflation with falling growth now something that we do need to be worried about is u.s bankruptcy filings we have seen the highest bankruptcy filings since year 2020 in COVID. however it's not necessarily a bad thing because we are seeing fewer liquidations and more reorganizations and this is why the bankruptcy system is set up like this it means a company that's under credit and debt distress they can file for bankruptcy reorganize and come out stronger at the end of it and this is generally what you want to see in a rate hiking cycle you want to see reorganizations and this is a really good thing it might mean short-term pain but it's really good in the longer term now data in the week ahead guys so not a big week of data the focus will be on retail sales and we have a ton of fed speakers so we get retail sales on tuesday the expectation is for advanced retail sales to come in at negative 0.4 percent this is both his estimate less autos and gas zero percent core control zero percent and then retail sales less autos negative 0.2 percent now looking at the consensus expectations vans retail sales should come in at negative 0.2 percent less autos and gas 0.3 core control 0.2 and less autos up 0.1 percent so quite a divergence between the consensus and both his estimates but the truth will obviously always be somewhere in the middle we also do have a couple of other key events building permits housing starts a jobless claims and then we have all of the major fed speakers i would pay attention to fed bostic he's a voter fed williams fed Dali, and then crash kari as well whenever he speaks the market moves but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers